Hi, everybody. In this lecture, we'll continue following the thread in our course, Catholic Intellectual Tradition, by looking at the outstanding event in Catholic life of the 20th century, the Second Vatican Council. This lecture follows our lecture last time, where we looked at the relationship between the Church and the modern world, focusing especially on the pontificates of Pius IX and Leo XIII. For much of the 19th century, as we saw, and into the 20th, there was a relation of opposition between the Church and the world. The modern world was felt to be a threat by many Catholics, and they wanted to present an alternative um, in the form of the thought of Thomas Aquinas and in other ways. We also read some of the work of Jacques Maritain, Integral Humanism from 1936, and in that work we saw just a bit of a kind of renaissance in Catholic thinking. Maritain was one of many authors, uh, largely in France and Germany in this period, who changed how Catholics think about the Church and about themselves as as Catholics. This period of vitality that we only slightly touched upon in this course led to this event, the Second Vatican Council, that we'll be talking about today. So let's dive into it. Our business will be to talk first about the council itself. What was this event? What happened? Uh, then we'll look at the readings that have been assigned, um, all connected with the council. One, a selection from Eve Congar's book, True and False Reform in the Church, um, and the other two being some documents of the council from Gaudium et Spes and Nostra Aetate. This image on the title slide is notable. So here we have the in interior of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, um, and these kind of... Um, what would you call them? The seating was erected um, on either side of the main um, portion of that of that building um, to to seat all of the bishops, theologians, observers, and others who gathered in the 1960s in four periods for this Second Vatican Council. This was an event unlike any other in church history to have leaders gathered globally from all around the world i mean this is facilitated by uh, air travel right which had only recently become uh, affordable uh, this was uh, a, as i say a defining event so let, let, let's look at it more closely what was vatican ii um here we have an image of, of john the 23rd pope john the 23rd um, who convened the second Vatican Council. This was the 21st what is called ecumenical council of the church. Um, ecumenical comes from the Greek word oikos, uh, ecumenical. Um, it means of the household. So when you talk about ecumenism or an ecumenical council, you mean that you're gathering Christians, in this case, of various traditions. Um, this, of course, included primarily the, the Roman Catholic tradition and, and that the Latin rite of that tradition, which is the majority. But there were observers from other Christian communities as well who contributed to the conversation. The council was held in four sessions between 1962 and 65, basically in the fall of that year. That's when the bishops actually gathered to talk about stuff. But outside of that, there were a lot of conversations, working groups, documents being drafted, preparations being made, and basically they would gather between something like September, November in each of those four years to ratify and vote upon and ratify those documents. What was the goal here? As we said, the church and the modern world, formerly in a relationship of almost hostility, certainly at times hostility, now enters into a new chapter of that relationship, a relationship of dialogue, dialogue, right? And, and there's an interesting body of literature about what the word dialogue means here, right? I mean, if you are Pope Pius IX locked inside the Vatican, right, and held at bay by secular military forces, you know, what would it mean in that context to dialogue with the world? Um, this is perhaps why Pius IX took the more hostile approach that he did. By this time, social conditions had changed, right? Uh, the, the Vatican was recognized as a, a sovereign city-state within Italy. Um, the, the culture had changed. Um, certainly, the work I mentioned before in France and Germany of thinkers um, who had re-envisioned Catholic identity um, had had its impact on, on um, 
on Catholic thought, and people wanted to open up to the world. And, and that's one of the two main themes here, two main motivations, or what I'm calling watchwords of the Council. The first is aggiornamento, and the second is risorsement. Aggiornamento is an Italian word, risorsement is a French word. Aggiornamento means opening. And there's a, a story, perhaps apocryphal, of John the Twenty-Third here speaking with, I believe, a, a journalist or a fellow bishop, um, and he was asked, "Why did you call this council, this Second Vatican Council?" And he walks over to the window and he gestures at this open window and said, "Maybe we'll just let a little fresh air into the church." And that this was an image that was really in people's minds at the time that the church had gotten kind of musty, right? It was kind of stuffy. It needed to open the windows, let in fresh air, engage with the world, have those conversations, not set up itself as an opponent to the modern world. So there's this opening, and that's what the word aggiornamento means in Italian. There's also, however, risorsement. And here you could translate this most directly as resourcing, right? Or it's uh, usually rendered return to the sources. They want, not, in opening, they wanted not just to kind of take on everything in the modern world and say, oh, okay, let's, let's just get ourselves up to date. They wanted to return to the earliest sources, scriptural, liturgical, theological, go back to those authors in the third, fourth, fifth century of the Christian um, of the common era, right, of Christian history, and find out how had Christian practice changed in the intervening centuries, and how could it be returned uh, in some form to be closer to that earlier practice, to go back to the sources and, and revitalize Christian, in this case Catholic life, in view of that. In the media, the council was presented as really kind of a battle between liberals and conservatives. Um, and Pope Benedict has spoken about there being almost two councils. There's the council of the, of the fathers, of the bishops who were there writing and voting on these documents, but there was also the council of the media, right? So there, were, there was a, a lot of uh, dramatization of what was happening, right? The, the conservatives were kind of stuck in the past and the, the progressives and the liberals were, were pressing forward and, and people took sides on that. So this was one of the first major events in Catholic life that took place in a very public way, you know, just as the, the people who took part flew there in, in planes, which wouldn't have been possible at the First Vatican Council. Um, it was also broadcast widely. I've added here as the last item on this slide, all in some sense were personalists. Um, and the meaning of that's going to become a bit clearer in a couple weeks when we look at personalism as a movement within Catholic thought and life. But I want to say now just that everybody was interested in this category of the human person, right? What it means to be truly yourself, to be authentically yourself, to, to live out your vocation in the modern world, right? We saw this a bit already with Jacques Maritain last week. What does it mean to be a Christian in the world, right? How do I interact with people who are not Christian? How do I be authentic to my calling as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Um, and so we'll come back to that idea of personalism later. Let's tell a bit of the story, though. So um, this is Pope John the Twenty-Third. He succeeded Pope Pius the Twelfth, who had been Pope during World War II and throughout the 1950s. Um, in 1958, I believe it was, uh, John, it might be 1959, uh, at the very end of that decade, John XXIII is elected Pope. He's an older guy. He had been the papal nuncio in Turkey during the war, and there he had seen a lot of the effects of World War II, not on the front lines, but in the surrounding region. He'd also interacted with a lot of um, Muslims and Jews and others and people of different faiths um, and worked with them in common cause during that period of conflict. He was seen as a kind of uh, short-term pope. He was an older guy. Um, he was called the good Pope John. People, people liked him. He was jovial and, and approachable and friendly. Uh, and it was in 1959 that this pope, who, who people didn't expect much of, uh, shocked the world, and, and that's not an overstatement, really shocked the world, and called for a new council at the Vatican, a new ecumenical 
Council. Uh, people were not expecting this. I mean, in the 1950s, there was a perception that the Catholic Church was strong. It was, you know, an institution that was really still kind of in this tense relationship with the modern world. But um, there, there wasn't a sense that that this, you know, not everybody felt that this council was needed. Um, although many did, and so those lines appeared. Um, but th this was this was not a council called in response to any. Um, pressing issue or, you know, doctrinal problem or specific thing that needed to be addressed. Uh, Pope John just wanted to rethink Catholic identity in the context of the modern world. And when, it, when he started planning it, it wasn't even clear what form this would take. He just wanted to begin that process. Now, Pope John lived until after the first session of the second Vatican Council, uh, and then he died. Uh, he was an older man at the time. Um, he was succeeded by this man, uh, Paul VI. Uh, and uh, Paul VI was faced with the decision. Would he continue the council after this first period, or would he not? And some people thought he should not, and some people thought he should. Uh, he decided to do it, and, and his pontificate, his time as pope, was defined uh, utterly by the Second Vatican Council but in the periods from 1962 to 65 when those meetings were actually happening, and then in the subsequent almost 15 years um, as the implications of the council were unfolded. The interpretation of the council began both in its letter and in its spirit. Here again is that image from inside St. Peter's Basilica. In the very center there, you have seated Paul VI. I mean, it's an interesting question because, you know, we saw last time that Pope Pius IX, it's the first Vatican Council, had established papal infallibility, right? And so what, what is the authority of a council when you have a pope that has so very much authority? And, and this is what Paul VI was navigating, was unfolding, negotiating, right? He was thinking about the, the structure of authority in the Catholic Church. Um, he himself signed all of the council documents, so they were, you know, composed by the council, but approved by him. So this was not a democratization of the Catholic Church, and the Pope still remained, as it were, in charge, um, but it brought into the conversation hundreds of um, bishops and others who formerly had not had not been able uh, or invited to take part. At the council, um, there were a number of figures who would play an important role subsequently and whom we're going to learn about in the coming weeks. One of them here is John Paul II. Here he is a cardinal, um, Karol Wojtyla, from Poland. Um, he was a Catholic cardinal in Poland at a time when Poland had a communist government and religion was suppressed. Um, so he was a person who felt this kind of conflict, as it were, with the modern world in a, in a very strong way in his, in his context there in Poland. But he took this approach very much of dialogue and of focusing, as we mentioned already, on the human person, right? On being authentically who you are in the world as a Christian. Um, his uh, contribution to the council, he was one of many contributing, um, but in subsequent years in his writings and then as Pope from 1979 onward, or is it eight or nine? Um, he was uh, very influential. We'll look at him later. Also at the council <clears throat> was uh, the man who would become Pope Benedict. So you had Carol Wojtyla, John Paul II, and you also had Joseph Ratzinger here depicted on the left together with our author for this week, Eve Congar. Um, so both John Paul II and Pope Benedict had been ordained before the Second Vatican Council. They were at the council. They were engaged in those conversations. And after the council, they were largely responsible um, on the institutional level of the church for interpreting um, the legacy and, and the implications of that council, at least up until the election of, of Pope Francis, um, who has contributed further um, to that interpretation. Um, but it's important to note that the, the people we'll be reading later in the course, they were there. They were defined by this event. 
Um, here's Paul VI on the right, depicted also with Jacques Maritain. Uh, Jacques Maritain came out as something of a critic of the council in, in the later 1960s. He had some, some questions about its implications and, and its execution. Um, but Jacques Maritain was very much respected by Paul VI. Paul VI had kind of become uh, more personally engaged in his faith through reading Jacques Maritain's works of philosophy, and, and Paul VI would refer to Maritain's work in his document Popolore and Progressio in the 1970s um, in the context of thinking about international development. Um, so Jacques Maritain, although not himself active at the council and even a critic of it to some degree, uh, was very much in the minds of people there. Uh, so we're seeing how what we talked about last week and this week are, are coming together in this, in this event. Um, this image, and I want to thank the, the creator of this image, whomever you may be, thank you very much, um, depicts the uh, 16 um, documents of Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council. Now, now, in the very center, you have here the word foundation, and there, there are two of them. The document on the liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, that has to do with the Mass and what you do when you go to church, and the document on Revelation, Dei Verbum, and that means the Bible. Right, so so liturgy and the Bible; those are the two foundation documents, the central documents, the constitutions. Right, those are joined by two other so-called constitutions, making for four in the total of constitutions that came out of this event. Um, Gaudium et Spes and Lumen Gentium. Uh, we're reading part of Gaudium et Spes, um, titled "The Church in the World," uh, and this is what is called the pastoral constitution. So this has to do with practical life. The other document is Lumen Gentium, the light of the nations or of peoples, um, and this has to do with the church itself. This is called the dogmatic constitution. So this has to do with kind of principles about what the church is, right? Not so much how it's engaging with others, but what it is in itself. So one, two, three, four, those are the four constitutions of Vatican II. We'll say less about what goes on Around the outside here, um, we have documents on external relations, so-called, so the relationship between the church and other uh, bodies, uh, largely ecclesial or, or church bodies. Uh, we have four documents on mission, uh, priests, education, communication, and missionary activity that is going into places where Christianity has not been preached and, and, and establishing Christian communities. And then we have uh, four documents on what are called here the people of God, uh, bishops, priests, laity, and, and religious. Importantly, it's at the council, and you see this in Gaudium et Spes, where the church is emphatically defined as the people of God. The church is the people of God. The church is not just a hierarchy. The church is certainly not just a building or a series of buildings or institutional relationships. The church is the people of the church, the people of God, right? So in these 16 documents, um, you have the, le the legacy of Vatican II. This is what Vatican II produced, 16 documents. Um, and of those, we're going to be discussing um, presently two of them, uh, Gaudium et Spes and the document on non-Christian churches and religions and the Jewish people um, called Nostra Etate. So I have here the, the legacy of Vatican II, and this could be an entire lecture in itself. In fact, the rest of this course really is about <laughs> this slide in a way. Um, there has been controversy about how Vatican II should be, be implemented. Um, and over the past 50 years or so, this is not historically unusual, um, some people have gone so far as to reject the council entirely, um, and folks of that persuasion um, are uh, considered to be out of communion with the Pope, with the Bishop of Rome, because they, they question the authority um, of popes from John the Twenty Third forward. Uh, Mel Gibson, the actor, uh, falls into, into that group as a traditionalist Catholic. Um, these Catholics often practice the Latin Mass, or what is sometimes called the traditional Latin Mass, or the extraordinary form of the Mass. Uh, they follow the uh, guidelines for the Mass published in 1962, uh, just before the Council began. Um, this has been, uh, especially in the United States, uh, has gotten a lot of attention in recent years, uh, kind of with the rise of social media as, as the message of those groups have gotten out. Um, and the Church, um, that is, in, in, the, in the person of Pope Francis and, and before him Pope Benedict, have had to figure out how to kind of 
negotiate that relationship, because here you have people who are in one sense very devout Catholics, but in another sense reject everything that the council represented and, and stood for, and the council does have authority in Catholic life. Um, others have questioned how the council should be implemented. So you have what are called in the media, you know, more conservative Catholics who want to kind of hone to the, the letter of the council, those 16 documents, and interpret those pretty uh, narrowly, um, more or less narrowly. And you also have uh, what are called in, in the media liberal Catholics, more progressively minded Catholics, who are interested in especially the spirit of the council, right? This openness to the Holy Spirit, to responding to the modern world in dialogue, to uh, accompanying people on their journeys. Uh, the Catholic Church is not, in my view, and I propose to you, actually so divided as it often appears to be. But there have been significant debates among Catholics, as there are after any council, about, again, how it should be interpreted. The most visible changes um, resulting from the council um, have been in liturgy. Um, so if you go to a Catholic church, if you went to 1960, you know, it's going to look one way, and if you go today, it's going to look very different. Right? It, it, it would have been in Latin. The priest would have been facing away from um, the people um, toward the altar, right, in the same um, direction as the people. I can never get my hands quite right here. Uh, whereas after the council, the priest has turned to face the people, the uh, orientation now being what's called ad populum, toward the people, um, and uh, the mass is celebrated in the vernacular language, the local language in the United States would be English or, or Spanish. Um, I have on the slide here an image of, of Pope Francis. Um, he is notably the first pope um, to have been ordained as a priest after the council. Um, and this is significant uh, in that his predecessors, John Paul II and Benedict, had been ordained before the council. They were at the council. They took part in that uh, as leaders um, and then and then later became Pope and, and shaped its implementation and interpretation. Pope Francis was ordained as a priest after the council. He was formed and grew up in the context of the council um, and, and is now continuing that interpretation, um, uh, and some say in a different spirit than, than his, his predecessors. But all of these leaders of the Catholic Church are, are finding ways to uh, make the documents of the council and its message relevant uh, today. Okay, so let's say a little bit about um, our readings. Uh, we'll start with Yves Congar. Now, why are we jumping back? I say here this book was written in 1950, as it was. Yves Congar was uh, one of the outstanding contributors to this period that I called earlier the kind of Catholic Renaissance, right? Especially in France and Germany, um, there was a just efflorescence, an explosion of original Catholic thinking. Um, this included the movement known as the New Theology, came to be called that, Nouvelle Theologie, uh, of Catholics rethinking this relationship between the church and the world. There was a lot of dissatisfaction with Thomas Aquinas. Um, it, was, it was felt that the reliance on Thomas Aquinas um, was not really engaging with him. It was just kind of repeating what he said in an almost mechanical way. Uh, and this was, was a cause of dissatisfaction among, among many thinkers. And there was a call for, you know, a new constructive engagement with the world that, that led to the council. Now, this book, True and False Reform in the Church um, by Congar, uh, Pope John XXIII read this book. He read this book, and this was a primary inspiration in his decision to call the council to begin with. So let's say a bit about this book. So there's a bit of a prequel to what we've talked about. So this event happened from 62 to 65. This book came out, what, about 12 years before that. Let's see where the council came from. Um, Congar himself, born 1904, died in 1995. French Dominican, priest and theologian. He was involved in this movement of resourcement that we've always meant we've already mentioned. So he was looking back at the past, earliest sources of Christian uh, history to try to kind of renew uh, Christian practice in the present. Um, he was actually, his writings were restricted 
by the Vatican from 1947 to 1956. In particular, this book that we are reading for today was forbidden by Pius XII. Um, this was seen as a troublesome book, as, as, a, as a kind of theology that had gone too far, right? Uh, so the fact that John XXIII, you know, read this book, I mean, itself not so remarkable, but then decided to act on it, to implement it, right? To, to really um, uh, change the profile of Congar and his ideas in the church was significant. Um, later on, Congar uh, came to a position of great respect in, in the Vatican. And so we see here some of the push and pull within the Catholic Church in this period. The concern of the book, what's the book about? It's a very simple question. How can you reform the church without splitting the church? How can you reform the church without splitting it? Okay, you want to update the church. You want to change some teachings. You want to change some practices. Can you just come in and say, all right, guys, here it is, right? And who's going to say that? The Pope or local bishops? Or how, how does it work, right? What does it look like to undertake what he calls a true reform, right? Um, true and false reform in the church. This guy's a Catholic, Eve Congar, right? So from his point of view, the Protestant Reformation was not a true reform of the church because it led to the formation of new churches, right? Okay, you got people now like Congar and others in this Nouvelle Theology and this kind of Catholic Renaissance. They want to see the church change and be updated to, you know, engage the modern world in a different way, but they don't want to start a new church Right? They don't want to just make the, the liberal Catholic Church versus the old Catholic Church. Um, so this is what the book is dealing with, is practically speaking, what motivates true reform in the church and how do you actually undertake it so as not to split the church in two? Now he starts from, in our selection, where we, have, we pick it up in chapter three, he's talking about prophecy prophecy. And this is going to be a really important idea uh, in the book and in the Second Vatican Council. One of the terms that we're going to see um, repeated in the council documents and, and in Congar is the signs of the times. The signs of the times. Christians need to read the signs of the times. They need to see what is happening around, and then they need to develop an authentic and you know, Christian response to that world. That's what we saw a bit with Jacques Maritain last time, right? What does it mean to be a Christian in the world? Well, um, for Congar, every Christian, of course, and this is not just for him, but in general, every Christian is baptized, right? And baptism is a certain kind of call to live a Christian life in the world. No surprise there. Um, but what he suggests, Congar, is that baptism itself uh, needs to be accompanied by what he calls a second birth. A person needs to be twice born, and we'll talk a bit about that language. Uh, a person, it's not enough simply to be, it is enough simply to be baptized if, if you want to uh, be considered a Catholic or a Christian. I mean, baptism is baptism. However, if you want to have a vibrant, um, authentic, engaged faith that is going to evangelize people, that's going to inspire people, you need to have a personal investment in that faith, in your life of faith and your discipleship. Um, thus, he raises this image of the prophet. Um, here we have an image of the prophet Isaiah, one of the, the prophetic figures in the Hebrew scriptures included in the Christian Bible. Um, the prophets of ancient Israel are exemplars of people who felt called by God to stand up for, very often, justice for those who were not receiving justice in those societies or to question religious practice that they felt had gone off the rails or was not being true to how it should be practiced. So all Christians, Congar is suggesting, need somehow to have this, this prophetic spirit, or at least that should be the goal of the church, is to inculcate, to cultivate, to encourage this kind of prophetic engagement with the world on the part of all, of all Catholics. Um, we are talking about this prophetic spirit. Let's take a look at this this short passage from the text, uh, Congo writes, so that the sap of Christianity can still thrust its shoots through the crust of history, the Holy Spirit, watching over the church, raises up servants 
whose fidelity goes beyond conformity to the status quo. Twice-born persons are needed for this. Okay, so what's the image here? You have people who are Christians. They are baptized. They go to church. They're nice people, right? Nothing the matter with these people as people. They're moral. They're good to their neighbors and so forth. They're generous. But they're not, uh, what would you say here? Um, they are conforming to the status quo, right? They are good Christian people following the, the rules. And that is a beautiful thing. But what Kongar is interested in here is, as he puts it, thrusting Christianity thrusting its shoots through the crust of history, right? If a plant is going to grow, it needs to be able to, to dig its roots down into the soil, right? It needs to be nourished by that soil, and then it can develop, grow, bloom, blossom, whatever you want, right? The church, he thinks, is the same way. If the church is just separate from the world, it's kind of sitting there as, as a museum piece, a nice thing that, that you know, maybe brings some meaning to my life, um, it's not something that is challenging me, that is calling me forth to do things at a personal sacrifice that really can transform history, engage in the struggles of history. This is what he's calling for. He uses this image of the twice born, and I probably should have an image, a picture up here of William James. William James, the psychologist and, and thinker about religion, who proposed in his book, 1902, Varieties of Religious Experience, this term of the twice born, right? So all of us are once born because you're listening to this lecture and presumably you have a body and you were born at some point. Um, but to be twice born uh, would mean to be born in a way that you take on a kind of personal commitment to the life that you're living. You actively choose it, right? You're born of the spirit as, as it's put. Let's have a look at this passage from uh, Congar. Some people, he writes, have experienced a kind of revelation, a new birth. They have discovered a new personal set of values and a kind of change has come over their lives, a personal set of values. They live their lives no longer in conformity to the received ideas of their social milieu or setting, but according to their own personal convictions. Right? Um, you can see that this is calling people to a kind of autonomy, to a kind of freedom, a personal choosing, right? Um, according to their conscience, the term will come out. In all of that, you can see why, on the one hand, church leaders opposed this to some degree, right? I mean, there's, there's a kind of negative picture here of people conforming to the status quo of, you know, going through the motions of, of church life. Um, at the same time, you can see why this inspired the council, because here is a call to go deeper, right? And not simply to kind of maintain Catholic traditions in the status quo in the face of the modern world, um, but to actually engage that world creatively and to bring about something to bring about something new through a personal transformation on the part of, of each individual. Um, this image of the spirit and the letter, which I've mentioned already in relation to the so-called liberal and conservative streams of the council is relevant here also and mentioned by Congar, uh, who writes, the prophet is opposed to the means becoming the end, opposed to the external form being sought and exalted for itself. Incessantly, prophets remind us that external forms take their meaning from a source way beyond themselves. They work toward interpreting the spirit that lies behind every letter. Right? Let me put up an image on the slides here. Um, here we have Martin Luther King Jr. often regarded as, as spoken about as a, as a prophetic figure. What, what does he do? I mean, think about the I Have a Dream speech, this very well-known speech, 1963. He returns to the sources of this American experiment of ours, referring to the Declaration of Independence, referring to the Constitution, these founding documents of the country. At the time, these documents were interpreted in such a way that uh, civil rights were not guaranteed for all Americans. He in returning to those documents, draws attention to their spirit. You know, what is the vision of America set forth here? What is the intent behind this, interpreted 
in its best light, most charitably, right? That it's not just all property owning men are created equal, but that all people are created equal. This is contained in this text, even if just as an aspiration, right? And he calls people to the deeper interpretation of those founding texts, not to their letter, but to their spirit. This is the kind of thing that Congar has in mind. And one of the reasons why that speech from King, the I Have a Dream speech of 1963, is so powerful. Now, when you have people calling for this kind of personal transformation, returning to the sources, questioning authorities and status quo, clearly you have some danger, right? Which is why this book was suppressed. Um, because what if people decide that, you know, their conscience leads them over here? And the Catholic Church teaches this, oh, I disagree with that, I'm going to practice this instead. Um, what does Congar say about this? Let's take a look at the passage and then I'll comment on it. Any prophetic spirit, he writes, looking for new revelation or for substantial additions to revelation or trying to change the revelation given to the apostles is not the prophetic spirit of the church. So there's no new revelation. We have the Bible. The scripture is revealed right? That is revelation. The gospel is revealed. He's not saying, let's come up with a new kind of Christianity 2.0. Uh, the apostles here are the 12 followers of Jesus, and he's going to use the word in a moment here, apostolicity, uh, and that's an unfamiliar word that simply means um, the fact that these apostles were sent. Uh, we get our uh, word postal service from this, right? When you post a letter, you send a letter. Um, the apostles, the apostles were people who were sent to spread the message of the gospel. Let's continue the passage. The only valid prophecy in the church, writes Kungar, is in the service of the church, church's apostolicity, of the church's mission to go forth and to preach the gospel. Once again, we have here the distinction between structure and life. I've placed that in italics. On one hand, there are the apostles and their apostolicity. That is the kind of pope, cardinal, bishops, structure of the church, traditions of the church, right? On the other hand, there is the apostolate marked by zeal and by the service of God. Here on the slide, I have an image of Francis of Assisi, right? Francis of Assisi was not pope. Francis of Assisi was someone who challenged all authorities, right? Because he wanted to call the church to this deeper purity, this purity of spirit, where you were engaged with God through nature, through a kind of, you know, brotherhood with the, um, with the creatures of this world and with other people. Uh, Pope Francis, uh, Pope Francis, I say, took his name from St. Francis. Uh, St. Francis is a really admired figure by many today for this reason. But this is the tension that Congar is really calling out here, the tension between structure and life. Uh, in, in one author refers to this as structure and anti-structure, right? Whenever there's development in something, there's a challenge of current structures and opening out to other kinds of possibilities. Um, uh, last a point on this matter of prophecy from Congar, how do you tell who is a genuine prophet? Okay, so I want some reform. I'm going to follow a prophet. Who am I going to follow? Genuine religious prophets, um, Congar writes, uh, just as non-genuine religious prophets, cannot avoid having the feeling of exaltation at having been chosen, inspired, given a mission, right? I'm zealous. I have energy. I believe in my cause, right? I'm going to go out there and work 25 hours a day. This is how they come to be so intrepid in their hope and their action, so inspiring also to others. But if they are genuinely sent from God, they experience as well an even deeper feeling of their own nothingness and their inability to trust themselves. So the suggestion here by Kongar is you can tell that a prophet is genuine if she has self-doubt, if she doubts herself to some degree, if there is a measure of humility amidst all of the almost intoxication of feeling that you're on this kind of grand world historical mission. Uh, we'll look just briefly at this passage, I'm concerned here about time, I want to keep us under an hour. Um, he writes, uh, Kongar, prophets don't belong to this world. The prophet always sees the opposite of everybody else. 
He reverses the apparent order of things that is actually false and rediscovers the real order. In addition, these men who contradict others are often misunderstood and persecuted. They're misunderstood because their prophetic words outpace the received ideas. They're ahead of their time, right? Uh, it outpaces the given mentality or the perspective of their time. They are persecuted because they annoy others by disturbing the prevailing order or security. They don't belong to this world. So you might say prophets are ahead of their time. Prophets are out of time, right? They're in the world, but not of it, to use another phrase often repeated here. And the danger of prophecy for Congar relates to things getting too abstract. Maybe I get in my head a kind of idea and I just want to implement that idea, right? Congress is going to say, that's dangerous. Um, the danger of isolated principles, I've called this one. Great reformers generally are simplifiers. This can be a strength, but also a danger. As has been said, heresies arise from, quote, deductions pursued in one direction only beginning with the principle of tradition or of science, isolated from everything else, exalted as absolute truth. From this, one reasons out conclusions that are incompatible with the synthetic order of religion and with traditional teachings. So I start with some kind of abstract principle, whether it's of science or of tradition, right? So he's saying it, it can be in either direction, very too religious or too secular, so to speak. Um, but if I just follow through on that principle, like, like a tank, and I just run over everything else and, and remain pure, stuck on my principle, there can be bad consequences here. And this is what he's, he's proposing. Um, just this and another slide briefly. Um, how then, in his view, can you follow through on this prophetic spirit and end up with true reform? We want to not split the church. Right? Well, how are we going to accomplish that? Four steps. First, the primacy of charity and of pastoral concerns. This is, relates to what we just said. Avoid developing an abstract system or starting a sect. Uh, focus instead on the concrete life of the church. And that means how, what people experience when they go to Mass on a Sunday every week. What's happening there? Start from that. Don't start from a, a book of theory or theology. Two, remain in communion with the whole church. He emphasizes in the reading we had the need for a fullness of truth. We need many different perspectives, all together, both and approach rather than an either or. Focus on, uh, in his text, there's a relationship between structure and life, what we might call today lived experience, between the center and the periphery. Um, interesting discussion of that as well. Initiatives, he says, often start at the periphery, not from the Vatican, from the center of things, but from the edges, right? From people who are not considered to be powerful in the church as it is. Um, third and fourth, having patience with delays. This is an interesting one. He was, calls us to avoid a kind of inflexible and exasperated logic toward all or nothing solutions, right? So I say here, confer the loss of the papal states. I mean, after that, there might have been a, a, a rush. There was, in fact, a rush to, you know, defend the church, lock things down, move quickly. This is an emergency, right? But he says that can be itself a danger. That can make things rigid and, and defensive, as we've seen. And finally, genuine renewal through a return to the principle of tradition, not novelty. This is that resource ma business, right? He's coming up with new ideas for the future by looking at the past carefully and in new and creative ways, right? Not simply coming up with a new idea from over here. I'm just going to pull this thing down and try this novelty, right? But to go back and say, look, Christians have always been trying to do X, you know, this is how they used to do it. This is how we do it today. How going forward should we try to accomplish that end, X, in a way that is true to this whole period of development? Um, I think just one or two comments here on uh, the conditions of true reform. Um, I mentioned already here the center and the periphery, uh, Congar writes. Initiatives often start at the periphery. They say that history develops at its margins. And that's right at the edges, right? The margin is closer to the periphery than to the center. 
Further, the center, with its vocation to oversee structure, prefers something defined to something that is searching and striving for expression. Yet a spiritual organism is more likely to grow out of the elements searching and striving for expression. So you got people at the Vatican, let's say, right? They're concerned with structure. They're concerned with keeping things stable, with holding it all together, right? They're not interested in searching and striving for new forms of expression primarily. They first of all want to make sure the, the lights go on and things run and, and so forth. So the newness is really coming from these peripheries. And Pope Francis, as we'll see in the documents we read from him later in the course, is very concerned with the peripheries, right? With, with, with bringing in the voices and perspectives of people who are searching and striving for expression to bring newness and vitality into the life of the church. Um, and a final um, passage here from Congar, ideas developing over time. And I just want to emphasize this, this conviction that he has, that if you take this abstract point of view and just try and implement a series of principles, you're going to end up in a bad way. Heresy, he writes, that is thinking outside of the church, out, out of line with the tradition of Catholic and Christian teaching, comes in large part from a purely intellectual grasp of something, a grasp too impatient to wait for life to develop and for the gradual learning that comes from experience. It is easy for the mind to grasp a straightforward truth. However, it is equally true that an idea develops only over time with respect to aspects other than those grasped by dialectics, let's say by logic or reason alone. This fuller kind of development demands experience, lived and nourished by human sensibility, by contact with the questions and conditions of life itself. So what is Congar saying here? Don't go to a university or a seminary or to the Vatican, lock yourself up, come up with a theoretical plan for updating the church or for defending the church, and then just implement that, right? You have to go out to the, we call it today, lived experience, to just the experience of Catholics, of Christians. Um, talk with them, learn from them, and then over time develop uh, a response um, to the issues that are felt to be pressing. Uh, that is adequate uh, from a Catholic point of view and responsive to the needs of people in the modern world. This is very much what Pope Francis is seeking to do, on my understanding, in his um, synods, uh, the various uh, councils that he has called, and we'll talk a bit more about that um, at the end of the course, but he's very much trying to draw in the periphery, learn from people, and move the church forward in that way. In our remaining few minutes here, I want to just touch on the two documents um, that were assigned. And of course, you could have an entire lecture about these. You can have an entire class about the documents of Vatican II. Um, here is a copy of those 16 documents. This is the kind of standard edition of that. All of the documents are contained in this volume. We're looking at the first part of one of them, Gaudium et Spes, and at uh, the second one uh, in, in its entirety, Nostra Aetate. Starting with Gaudium et Spes, as mentioned before, this is a pastoral constitution. Pastoral um, has to do with the image of sheep, right? Jesus is the good shepherd. He tends to the sheep. Um, a, 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 a person who tends to sheep is doing pastoral work in the pasture, right, where the sheep are. So a pastoral constitution has to do with how Christians, in this case Catholics, should engage with people in the world, outside of the church itself, a pastoral uh, concern. This is one of the last documents to be released. We're reading just the very beginning of it, the preface, introduction, and the first chapters of, of part one of the document. Um, and interestingly, the second half of the document deals with a lot of concerns that are really contemporary with that period in the 1960s, um, war and peace, uh, population, ecology, things like this. Um, whereas the first part is stating general principles, which is why we're, we're looking at it. It starts from the situation of man in the modern world. So it's not opposing the modern world. It's asking, okay, what is it like for people to live in the modern world, let's find out, then let's address those people where they are, 
right? And then chapter one is focused on the individual human person in the modern world, and chapter two on community. That is specifically the dignity of the human person and the community, as it calls it, of, of mankind. So this person community, person community, that's the focus of this document. Um, this is by far the, the most famous passage in this document. Um, the opening lines of Gaudium et Spes, this becomes a rallying cry around the whole council. The joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the men of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted, these are the joys and the hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Key sentence. Indeed, nothing genuinely human fails to raise an echo in their hearts. For theirs, Christians, is a community composed of men, of people. United in Christ, Christians are led by the Holy Spirit in their journey to the kingdom of their Father, the kingdom of God. And they have welcomed the news of salvation, which is meant for every man, every person. That is why this community realizes that it is truly linked with mankind and its history by the deepest of bonds. Compare this with the syllabus of errors. Compare this with some of the later um, statements from the Second, First Vatican Council and some of the more hostile framings of the relationship between the church and the world. Here, on the level of deepest expression, the joys and the hopes of people, um, the church is uh, declaring a bond. Gaudium et spes literally means joys and hopes. Um, <clears throat> here we have a reference to um, what uh, Christians should do in the world. And we, uh, we uh, gesture here at the signs of the times. Um, people are to be led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The people of God believes that it is led by the Lord's Spirit who fills the earth. Motivated by this faith, it labors to decipher authentic signs of God's presence and purpose in the happenings, needs, and desires in which this people has a part uh, along with other men of our age. For faith throws a new light on everything, manifests God's design for man's total vocation, and thus directs the mind to solutions which are fully human. What's the idea here? The church is illumined, is guided by the Spirit to read the signs of the times, to look around, to see what is happening in the world, and to speak about those events in a way that calls people to be truly and fully human, right, to a humane response. Remember, this is happening in the wake of the revelations about the Holocaust and the event of World War II as well, right? There's a great desire for more humane forms of living. And the church is in a position to do this in part because it understands what true freedom means, what authentic freedom means. Let's take a look at this passage. Only in freedom can man direct himself toward goodness. Our contemporaries make much of this freedom and pursue it eagerly, and rightly to be sure. Here they're talking especially about people who are maybe not religious, but speak uh, with energy about freedom. <clears throat> Often, however, they foster it perversely as a license for doing whatever pleases them, even if it is evil. For its part, Authentic freedom is an exceptional sign of the divine image within man. For God has willed that man remain under the control of his own decisions so that he can seek his creator spontaneously and come freely to utter and blissful perfection through loyalty to him, to God. Right? What is freedom? Right? So this is the church not saying, as it did before, don't uphold freedom. Right? This is part of the bad view of the modern world. We have to oppose you know, human rights, liberty, this kind of thing. Instead, support freedom, but authentic freedom. So what is freedom really? This is the new form of dialogue that the church is engaging in. Not saying no to the world, but saying yes, but. yeah, Yes, let's think about that more deeply. And the last passage here I want to look at from Gaudium et Spes <clears throat> Concerns atheism. This is one of the famous passages in the document, suggesting that maybe Christians themselves have actually contributed to the rise of atheism in the modern world. Um, believers themselves, Council Fathers write, frequently bear some responsibility for modern atheism. 
For taken as a whole, atheism is not a spontaneous development, but stems from a variety of causes, including a critical reaction against religious beliefs, and in some places against the Christian religion in particular. Hence, believers can have um, more than a little to do with the birth of atheism. To the extent that they neglect their own training in the faith, or teach erroneous doctrine, or are deficient in their religious, moral, or social life, they must be said to conceal rather than reveal the authentic face of God and religion. What is one of the greatest complaints that you often hear about religious people? They are hypocritical. They say one thing in church and they do another thing in practice. Right? And so here we have Vatican II suggesting that that itself is a cause of doubt uh, for people in the truth of what is being proclaimed. If, if you regard Christians as hypocritical, well, you're not going to be called to, you're not going to feel called to, to become a Christian yourself. Who wants to be a hypocrite? Nobody wants to be a hypocrite. Um, something certainly worth our discussion and consideration. Um, last word here in just our remaining few minutes. On Nostra <clears throat> Etate, meaning um, in our times, being the, the translation of that Latin title, this is the very last document to be released. And my goodness, the Council Fathers worked over this for years through many drafts. This was in some ways felt to be one of the most important documents of the Council, certainly its shortest. It's only five pages long. But it concerned, at first, the relationship between the Church and the Jewish people, um, that is, people who had been persecuted so mercilessly and, uh, and violently in the event called the Holocaust, um, but also uh, opened up to dialogue with Muslims and with people of other faiths um, uh, at large. <clears throat> The church, um, it is held, if there's going to be like a thesis statement of this document, the Catholic Church held that it possesses, has been granted, humbly carries forth, the fullness of truth. The fullness of truth, right? And that fullness of truth is Jesus Christ. Um, but all, quote, great religions of mankind share to some extent in, reflect to some degree this truth, a measure of this truth. So it's not the case, according to Vatican II, that the Catholic Church has the truth and Protestant Christians, Orthodox Christians, Jews, Muslims, atheists, Buddhists, Hindus, everybody else has simply falsehood, you know, simply worships demons or something like this. That is not the case um, in terms of contemporary Catholic teaching. What is the case is the Catholic Church is held to have the fullness of truth and other traditions are thought to potentially participate in that um, to reflect to some degree the, the truth um, that is held in the Catholic Church. Um, let's take a look at the just a couple passages briefly where this is discussed. Uh, truth and holiness in other religions. <clears throat> other religions, Nostra Aetate declares, uh, found everywhere, try to counter the restlessness of the human heart, each in its own manner, by proposing, quote, ways, compromising, te uh, comprising teachings, rules of life, and sacred rites. The Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in these religions. That's the key phrase. The Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in these religions. She regards with sincere reverence those ways of conduct and of life, those precepts and teachings, which, those differing in many aspects from the ones she holds and sets forth, nonetheless often reflect a ray of that truth which enlightens all men, capital T, truth there. So we're starting from, quote, the restlessness of the human heart. And you'll see that's where the document in general starts from. This is section two. Um, all human beings are on some kind of a religious quest, are called by God from a, a Catholic point of view um, to this fullness of truth. And there are many expressions of that truth. Um, now, the Catholic Church is not saying that all of those expressions are equivalent to each other, right? Or that there is no truth. It is maintaining that Jesus Christ is the fullness of truth in the message of the gospel. But it's changing um, its expression of how it regards other traditions. And this has been enormously impactful in Catholic life and also uh, controversial, uh, especially among traditionalist Catholics. 
Um, a final passage here from Nostra Aetate, and then we'll wrap up. Um, against persecution, I've titled this. So there's a practical call in this document as well. In her rejection of every persecution against any man, the church, mindful of the, the patrimony, the inheritance she shares with the Jews, and moved not by political reasons, but by the gospel's spiritual love, the church decries hatred, persecutions, displays of anti-Semitism directed against Jews at any time and by anyone. The church reproves as foreign to the mind of Christ any discrimination against men or harassment of them because of their race, color, condition of life, or religion. On the contrary, following in the footsteps of the holy apostles Peter and Paul, this sacred synod ardently implores the Christian faithful to live for their part in peace with all men so that they may truly be sons of the Father who is in heaven. Notably, the Catholic Church over history has been blamed, often rightly, for promoting anti-Semitism. Um, the claim that uh, the Jews killed Jesus, right? That, that somehow the Jews, um, as depicted in the Gospel accounts, are morally responsible for the death of Christ, that they, were, that they murdered uh, Christ or arranged for the murder of Christ by the Romans. Um, these these discourses, these ways of speaking over time are here uh, in Nostra Aetate, categorically uh, rejected by the Catholic Church, and this remains robustly the teaching of the Church uh, to this day. Friends, what have we done in our time together? We began by talking about the Second Vatican Council. What was this event in 1962 to 65? A transformation in how the Church engages the world, not confrontation, but dialogue. We looked at the roots of the Council in the work of Eva Congar, True and False Reform, in the Church. It's carrying forward the spirit of prophecy. It's reforming the Church without changing or breaking the Church. And then we looked at two examples of documents released by the Council, among the 16 that were published, Gaudium et Spes and Nostra Aetate, concerning the role of the Church in the modern world and uh, the relation between the Church and non-Christian religious traditions. Thank you very much for your attention, and next time we will continue by looking at a novel, in fact, uh, by Shusako Endo. <laughs>